All right. Well, thank you for coming along, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Blodgett. I'm coming in as the uh, IT&I committee chair for the next little while. Um, you may remember I helped lead this committee two, three years ago before my now two-year-old daughter was born. And I um, stepped away stepped away and passed, passed the role on for a little while and um, agreed to come back and help out with, with the, the series. And my, uh, my hope is that we can shake this up a little bit um, and kind of both go back to some of how the committee used to uh, run or the, the, the kind of nature of the committee, committee used to have with the idea of rants and raves. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But I also wanna see if there are things that the, um, the committee and its kind of regularly scheduled webinar format can do to expand our impact just a little bit and, um, and hopefully expand the, the kind of um, you know, foundation that we lay in these meetings a little bit to hopefully record some of the outcomes in a way that they're available, not just in webinar recordings, but uh, potentially in, in other venues, um, wiki, wiki content in particular. Um, but, but as we go here today, um, I'd really appreciate it if folks can think about what are the actions that we could take, even if just in the, um, in the act of listening to a webinar, if there's a place or a way that we could um, kind of leave some, leave some breadcrumbs of what we've learned and what we're, you know, what we're hearing, hearing and um, going through, what could we do as a, you know, this is a group of people, 20, 30 people that get together on a semi-regular basis to, to hear interesting new or interesting in general um, IT interoperability topics. Um, you know, what, what are the kind of low, the low level of effort uh, and worthwhile things that we could do to, to leave some, some breadcrumbs? That's really the question here. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to just go ahead and jump in because we've got um, a, a list of kind of lightning talk rants and raves for you to chew on. Uh, this is a, a set of talks that we assembled for the um, IT&I session at the winter meeting. And we decided let's do it again because not everybody got to see it at the winter meeting. Uh, and it was pretty, that was just a couple weeks ago. So it's, we haven't had a heck of a lot of time to get things together. So this was kind of an easy, um, let's reuse that content and have a, big, a little bit different audience and, and hopefully learn a few more things and get, get a few more ideas on the table. So, um, so I, I'm gonna stop there and Mike, Mahoney is your first speaker. Um, we'll do the same order we did last time. So it'll be um, Mike with Make Re Reproducibility Easy, myself with Fair Data and Science Data Gateways, Doug Phils with Web Architecture and Semantic Web, um, Megan Carter will talk a little bit about um, the ESIP infrastructure opening doors for collaboration, um, Douglas Rao uh, talking about AI ready data. And if Matt Jones made it, I don't know if he did, he's got to talk about. Um, so many toothbrushes, uh, which is fascinating if, if we can, if he ends up on. Um, so we'll do that. And then um, we've got a kind of a list of discussion questions here that we can talk through and, and hopefully just have a little bit of a dialogue and build, build out a little bit of a set of ideas for where to take this this year. So um, unless there are pressing questions, I would pass it to you, Mike. My only question, uh, am I right in thinking we're doing slightly shortened versions of the talk? Yeah, I mean, we've only got an hour. We had an hour and a half last time, so we took five five or a little more minutes. But if you want to kind of skip, skip a little bit of content or, or move through a little quicker, that's fine. Yeah, I'll start in the middle. Let me find. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to reuse the joke that I made at the meeting, which is to say that I'm kicking us off with the prompt that we were given was to do either rants or raves about uh, technology of our choosing. And I'm starting off with a rave. I'm doing the good vibes only introduction talk, which uh, the core thing that I was trying to get at is that when you're doing any sort of workflow, be it an analysis, be it uh, data management pipelines, things along those lines, the ways that we tend to structure these things 
encourage a lot of complexity in how we actually get things done. You have a series of tasks that you need to do to move data around, to run an analysis, to get some results out. And you wind up taking each of those tasks and structuring them either as a million files living on your desktop, a million cells and random notebooks that are saved to different locations. And remembering where everything lives in the order that it needs to run in winds up introducing a lot of cognitive overhead on your end. It winds up creating a lot of complexity for you whenever you need to actually run the pipeline from start to finish. And so my rave is about a series of tools and then one in specific that help you transform that set of dependencies and that complex relationship of all of these pieces of these pipelines into directed acyclic graphs, into workflows that have clear and explicit dependencies between each step of your analysis of your data management workflow of whatever it is that you need to get done. And so specifically, I personally tend to work mostly with R and tend to use R-based tools. And so my favorite tool that helps make these dependencies between steps of analyses of workflows, my favorite tool for this sort of purpose is this package for R called Targets, which takes those building blocks of your workflow turns them into an explicit graph, and then gives you the tools to execute that graph in order in the correct way every single time. Uh, I particularly like targets because it's also very smart about how it does this. It lets you selectively invalidate parts of your pipeline so that you can only update things that need to get updated, saving yourself a lot of processing time. It watches your outputs and notices if anything changes so that it is aware of what needs to get rerun at any given step. And it's got a lot of built-in support for automatic parallelism if you have uh, outputs that don't depend on each other and for working with high performance computing centers with distributed computing with cloud environments with a lot of different backends to make it really flexible for a lot of different applications and workloads i really like targets because it has all of these things baked in but in general this idea of these tool systems that help you make dependencies explicit are really useful for anything that you need to do more than once, for anything that needs to be reproduced. This sort of approach of making these dependencies really explicit and living somewhere other than your head has saved me a lot of trouble. And so highly recommend this general approach to doing workflows. Thanks. Cool. I'm just gonna do a screen share. All right, so also a huge fan of targets and uh, it's brand new and totally game changing. Um, and I'm, that's actually one of the focus areas I think I want to continue thinking about in this group. Um, but now for something a little bit different. Um, I am fascinated by anti-patterns. And one of the anti-patterns that I'm most fascinated by is this concept of a walled garden. And I got thinking about high performance computing infrastructures, whether cloud-based, you know, Pangeo style or um, on-premise HPC style, and thinking about them as, as walled gardens, potentially in competition with um, the ideas around uh, fair data and open data. And so, Thinking about what what is fair data, right? Is and and this is actually maybe a little bit of an aside. You know, is is fair data free? Is fair data available? Um, does does fair data have to perform? Um, those are potentially competing interests, right? Um, you know, performant IT infrastructure is expensive. And so how do we square that circle, right? We've got science data gateways that are all about um, performance and capacity um, and of, you know, being available to a certain set of people, which is absolutely, it's almost the definition in my mind of a walled garden. Um, you know, isn't this an anti-pattern? Like, but we call this in many senses, this in the idea of a, science data gateway is, is held up as, as a, a best practice, um, is, as this is how we do big, you know, big at, sale, at scale computational science. Um, and then cross this with this dichotomy of cloud versus on-premise. And I mean, to me, this is an engineering decision. Um, and 
there's been a push toward cloud infrastructure, but um, you know, that's created some technical silos and some technical barriers to interoperability, um, both in, in open data and in this, this idea of a science data gateway. That's the, I find, I found, find fascinating. And there's just a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions, I guess. Uh, I have a lot, there's a lot to think about in this space um, when, when we're talking about kind of computing capacity and, and open data. So I think we need to better understand the space. Um, it's, you know, there's been a lot of really interesting stuff about cloud native moving to the cloud. Um, there's been a lot of interesting stuff about science data gateways, you know, what we can do by, by building these, these environments that are very flexible and capable. Um, but how do we, you know, how do we bring these two, two closer together? And how do we shoulder the burden of data availability? Um, you know, how do we um, have science data gateways become part of a data commons, so to speak? And there's a lot of thought in this area. Um, the Pangeo community is thinking about this in a pretty deep way. Um, and there's also a lot of thought going in, into this in, in the more traditional HPC communities um, that I think is, is really important kind of next steps to, to open data and kind of at scale computational science. So like I said, I have a lot of questions. Um, how do we bridge these divides? Um, how do we you know, make sure that the corporate cloud is kind of built into the systems we're building in academic and, and public sector infrastructure um, in a way that's um, not choosing favorites and, and being fair and open to everybody, but also allowing us to, to scale up our work and, and do things that are new and necessary and, and exciting. So that's pretty much what I have. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an economic question as much as anything. Um, it's a question of equity and, and openness and inclusiveness. Um, and, and it's something I think, you know, looking at the egress fees and the way that we're treating cloud computing relative to egress fees, this is becoming a really important thing for us to be thinking about. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I hope this can be a bit of a topic or a bit of a, a side of, of an undercurrent for, for our talks and our considerations going into this year. So that is what I have. Next up is Doug Fells. There we go. We see you. And now you, hopefully you can hear me. So yep. hello, everyone. My name is Doug. Uh, and uh, my shtick typically is structured data on the web, right? And so this is what my talk was about. So I just want to give a little brief kind of summary of um, some of the things that, that I've seen that are really interesting and I think are, are, are worthy of raves and some of the things that I think are kind of um, areas that we need to address in, in our rants or maybe kind of express some of the things that would be interesting um, to address in a, in a uh, IT and I or in this session. So, um, you know, for me, working in this environment has been really rewarding because the web architecture is such a wonderful architecture to deal with, right? Uh, it scales well, it has errors uh, that we can see and, and react to and things like that. So I think one of the really powerful things has been this um, mechanism of expressing the structured data, uh, leveraging this web architecture, architectural environment. JSON-LD has obviously been a wonderful serialization of the underlying RDF data model because we have so much tooling available and so much experience in the community. And this is one of the things that's been really nice about this approach is that it's really a commodity type approach with lots of experience, uh, lots of tooling, lots of um, you know, software packages that either already can operate in this environment or quickly are able to implement this type of approach for sh sharing metadata. We've seen this in the growth of Google Dataset Search uh, and that approach there and how those elements can then help address those those fair principles, right? And, and and really address many of the elements of those fair principles. I think some of the things that I've seen that have um, been areas I think would be interesting and, and more focused is that while that JSON that, that JSON LD that that commodity type approach is is valid, when you start digging down into the nuances of actually expressing linked open data on top of a web architecture. Elements like the at ID or other at terms within the JSON LD are a little bit more nuanced in terms of how people understand them and realize 
the proper ways in which to represent their metadata and their resources in a web architectural environment that really facilitates machine access. And that, that's a key element here. We're really looking at the machine access aspects of this. And so some of the some of the rants I suppose I would have is that I, I do see some interesting um, friction or impedance between API approaches and linked open data approaches. API approaches in reality being more for developers than machines in reality. I think there's an argument that can be made uh, for, for that uh, view into that. I have nothing against APIs. Obviously, they're incredibly important. And in fact, I, what I'd really like to see is how can we get the API patterns and linked open data patterns or the web architectural patterns even closer together in that regards. Uh, I also think there's a lot of uh, potential in terms of validation and monitoring using things like Shackle and other approaches in there. Uh, there are some interesting web architectural approaches also coming down the line with things like signposting and, and elements like that that I think have both virtues and vices that are worthy of uh, exploring in this regards. We see things like fair digital objects becoming more popular, um, things like that. So I guess just overall, I think that uh, there's a lot of potential here. There's uh, a lot of experience that we can tap into. And there's a lot of nuances that we need to begin to better explain and better present so that those people can understand how to implement them properly. And also, I think there's an element of community maintenance um, that needs to take place where we, we realize what the workflow of maintaining a system like this in a community environment looks like. So that's just a rapid fire overview uh, of that topic. It's one which I, I really enjoy and appreciate the opportunity to present on. Straight on, thank you, Doug. There's so that anyways, that could consume the entire next two years of talks. <laughs> next up is Megan Carter, I think. All right. Hopefully do this properly. Are we seeing the right thing? Okay. All right. So I'm ESIP's community director. Uh, but my fellow speakers have set the bar really high. So I'm gonna try to go fast. Um and I'm excited to talk to you today. Um, many of you know already that ESIP um, exists to help members of the earth science data community to find each other and to work together on common data challenges and opportunities. And the way that we assist folks in doing this is by providing rich collaborative experiences to them. Um, but we are not just a, a community. We don't just want to call ourselves a community of cool people doing cool things, but we want to foster a sense of community. Um, and that's more than just a place to come to or a group of people. It's a feeling that members have of belonging, a feeling that they matter to one another and to the group, and a shared confidence that they'll find what they need by working together. So our tools and our staff really need to be helping us move um, in this direction. And the set of collaboration tools that ESIP offers is many and varied, and there's a reason for this. Um, they serve different functions, and they keep ESIP a configurable experience. Um, but these do require a lot of care and maintenance, and we want to be really intentional when we make a change, keeping in mind the sense of community we're trying to foster and protect. So today I'm going to rant, I guess, a bit about the ESIP wiki, um, and I want to introduce it to you. So the ESIP wiki has been this long-standing sandbox. I remember when I first came on board, and I've seen it in, in employees who've joined ESIP more recently, um, I was very critical of it because it didn't look fancy and it seemed out of date, um, but I have come to appreciate that it's a place for the community to create and manage their own content without staff assistance. And this to me is, is the most important function that it offers. The challenges are like that of a lot of wikis. The content is out of date in many places. We can't exactly tell you in all the places it's out of date. Many people find it intimidating to edit or they don't even try because they think it's hard. Um, the relationship to the ESIP website is tricky. The ESIP website is a WordPress site that the ESIP staff maintain, um, but it's not a very seamless transition from one to the next. And then the elephant in the room here, I didn't include this in my last presentation, is that it costs us over $13,000 per year plus additional periodic costs for upgrades to um, continue to use the wiki. And this is part of the reason why we, it's really important to evaluate whether we're getting what we need from the wiki and also 
not just from the wiki, but from the technical support we currently have for it. Um, here I list some of the specific content that can be found on the ESIP wiki. Some of it's contributed by participants, some by staff, some by partners and sponsors. For example, some of our federal partners have spun down their own wikis or they've internalized them and they've expressed interest in moving content over or have already done so. Um, in the last 30 days, I looked this up, uh, which is probably a, a slightly quiet, quieter time in the ESIP community, um, given our, our larger conference and the holidays, et cetera. Um, there were updates made to five different collaboration area spaces. Um, the attribute convention for data set discovery, which is one of our most visited um, resources on the wiki, was also updated. Um, and the staff used the wiki for uh, posting partnership applications for comments. So I'm being really clear here about how I hope how we're using this space. Um, we have, uh, click Megan. Okay. For a more beautified description of some of our groups, um, our fabulous communications director, Allison Mills, has been helping us to create this kind of middle layer of beautiful semi-static landing pages for each ESIP collaboration area between our main ESIP website and between what the collaboration areas uh, maintain on the wiki. Um, but again, keep in mind, this doesn't fully fill the need for a public facing editable place for the, the community to edit. Um, for things like notes and um, some resources, the community has kind of naturally moved in the direction of using Google Docs and Google Drives uh, much more than they had when the wiki was first created. Um, which is okay, I think, except for some access issues in certain countries and, and some restrictions on use um, for some of our partners. So I think um, we don't fully know how the wiki would be used or could be used if we were to promote its use more. Um, one thought I have too is like even to give it a very specific purpose, much more than just a space to play in. Um, we don't know if we provide better guidance or recommended or required even ways of using it for certain ESIP groups, how that might um, affect what exists there. There might be something better, or maybe we can do without some of the functionality altogether. I'm not totally convinced. Um, and I'm not saying that this group needs to decide that, um, but you're an important um, set of opinions to get. So how can IT and I help? Um, Tell us how you would use the wiki, how you are using it, what you think would be missing if we didn't have it. Um, keep your eyes and ears open to new things and, and talk about them. Um, keeping in mind what I said before about the sense of community and the pace of community kind of being a little bit slower than just jumping on, you know, the newest, coolest thing that we see. Um, and I think that's everything I wanted to share. Awesome. Yeah, I started poking around the wiki and there's a lot to think about to figure out given the cost, um, what should be what should we be doing with that? All right, and next up is Douglas Rao. Right. Thanks, everyone. I am by day my job as mostly folks on machine learning satellite. And uh, since stumped on into ESAP five years ago, I started looking more and more into data management. So we have a cluster called Data Readiness Cluster, focused on AI ready data. And what we are working, trying to do have uh, four different aspects about AI ready data. First of all, is trying to develop and maintain an AI ready data standards. And then for on the short term, we want to review the common domain data standards and looking at how it compares to our current version of AI ready data checklist. And then, and based on that review and then develop a proposed community standards of AI ready data and um, going through some publishing process and, uh, long-term goals to try to maintain that uh, specific AI ready data standards. And the second one is to develop those automated tools for AI ready data assessments. And so right now we have a spreadsheet, basically an Excel, um, Excel table uh, using the checklist to do assessment, which is really manual, like labor intensive. So uh, we want to, um, long, long term, we want to try to develop metrics and automate, automate it AI readiness assessment to make sure that it can be easily used by the repository data centers. So it's not really uh, additional um, requirement or additional things that they have to do, but they don't have resources to do. And third part is trying to develop and improve those AI ready uh, data in mostly uh, the open environment data. That's our focus. And 
currently we're trying to uplift a pilot set of uh, thematic area data focused on the climate and the midterm and try to develop the tools and leading practice and how people to improve data readiness um, for people who are producing or who are managing those data. And then the last piece is try to sustain the engagements, especially focusing on um, to in, in, enhance the engagement with industry because a lot of the uh, development in machine learning and AI tools and um, our research have been uh, heavily in the industry side and then environmental data has really strong implication uh, applications uh, in different sectors. It's not just in our own research field. So that engagement would be really important and trying to make sure uh, we can also develop like uh, training materials based on different like user needs and user types. So thinking about what, what we're trying to do and few things came to mind that can be a limitation or things that need to be addressed. And so first of all, it's trying to balance in the common AI readiness with really specific needs for different applications, use cases and domains. When we're talking about AI ready data with people, uh, the first question we always get is that, oh, this doesn't really seem to that ready for my specific application that using the satellite image to find the seals um, on ice. And um, it's always a tricky balance trying to um, do something that's general enough can be applied to a wide variety of environmental data. Then, and there's a, a last mile problem. So what's the, how can we address the last mile problem of general AI readiness to the really specific AI ready application uh, data for the specific applications. That's when those like tool and software and data service developments can come seem really helpful. And then also it's trying to right now want to understand overlapping and gaps between those existing community and co domain data standards versus the, the AI readiness that we're trying to do. And then what's the um, gaps we want to uh, address rather than reinventing everything like from the scratch. And also it's thinking about standard process can be like slow evolving, but then the technologies in the AI machine learning development are really rapidly uh, evolving. So how can we balance in the speed, uh, the speed difference in the two, st two style of development and to make sure that things we're trying to do with already standards or community or convention um, I can really meet the uh, rapid evolving nature of those AI machine learning technologies and, and, and tool developments. And I'm not sure if Matt is here or not, but I just want to share this like uh, XKCD comic because uh, we are talking about standards here. All com and so, and it's always trying to balancing data standards. And then uh, is there something that we're trying to develop a new that can be used for or that just a different data standards that need somehow to find a way to to organize with others. So I'm just going to stop here and uh, happy to uh, look forward to the discussion. All right. Don't think, no, I don't see, don't see Matt. So fantastic. Um, I see a number of claps, uh, snaps. Anyways, uh, thanks for running through those. We're right at about a half hour, so that's perfect. Um, before we jump into questions, I just want to share a couple of things that I think synthesize this a little bit from, from my perspective. And, and this is a little bit of an echo of what we heard at the last um, time these talks were given. Um, and one of the big ones for me is, you know, looking back 10 years, 15 years to when I was writing workflows in MATLAB in grad school, um, man, have we come a long way. Um, the, the availability of data um, as resources on the web and the ability to have reproducible workflows that start from scratch, um, that was not at all possible a decade ago, in, in, by and large. And we're, we're at a whole new place now. Um, but a lot of the fundamentals of how we still do our work haven't really changed. Um, and I'm really interested in revisiting some of those fundamentals. Um, I think some of the stuff you're calling for, um, Douglas, is in line with that. Um, some of the stuff Mike's talking about. Um, 
the slides he didn't show us were basically looking back in time, showing how these workflows have really technically evolved, but their structure hasn't really changed. Um, and anyways, so this like revisiting fundamentals idea is really compelling to me um, and having some people that, um, that have some background and some history of where a lot of the things we're doing now have come from might be a worthwhile thing to, to think about um, seeking out. Um, the other one, as Douglas pointed to at the very end there, um, there's a serious proliferation of entry points to a lot of a lot of the different systems and tools and data sets and everything that we work with. Um, and that's both good because we're supporting a broad you know, set of use cases and subdomains and needs and disciplines and blah, blah, blah. But it's also um, it's also maybe not entirely necessary to have such a such a proliferation in all cases. Um, and that balance and like finding ways to have that proliferation of entry points and standards um, be a strength um, that we can we can rely on and not necessarily just complexity is a, a really interesting space. Um, and then this idea of, and this really resonates with me, is this idea that the ITNI has really just been a series of talks about shiny objects um, that has been great to build enthusiasm about the object and not necessarily great to grow a consensus process or you know, keep track of best practices. Um, it's, I, I wanna find a way to harness that enthusiasm. That was some, somebody brought that up in the discussion after the, um, the winter, winter meeting session. Um, and so, so I'll stop there and say, you know, given that like fundamentals as a, a kind of theme, um, understanding where diversity of use case and diversity of, of solutions is good versus how do we have common shared best practices um, is a, something interesting. And then how do we, how do we harness the enthusiasm for the shiny object to turn that into something that we're, we're leaving breadcrumbs essentially. Um, and Megan's, Megan's talk about the wiki is one that I've always felt like we should be doing a better job with the ESIP wiki. Um, and when I say we, I mean the IT and I committee because our wiki page is awful. <laughs> so, so maybe start there. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I, I guess I'll, I'll open the floor there. And you know, the, the discussion questions we have are a bit down in the, um, the Google Doc that was linked in the notes. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what does everybody, what would you like to learn more about in this space? You know, is there anything from the, the talks you just heard that's especially topical? Um, and, and really, does it, do people have ideas for what this committee could be that's more than a seminar series? Those are the two big things I'd love to hear from people on. Well, um, you know, uh, listening to your talk, where you talked about the anti-patterns and the walled garden, um, reminded me <laughs> of something that I've heard over and over and over again for at least two decades, probably three. This is there's a lot of gray in this beard, right? And and this this is this is part of what happens. You go to a meeting and there's presentation after presentation about. <clears throat> websites that do such and such and they're all pretty much sealed off from one another and if you're the developer of a of an underlying technology a middleware technology unless it's a file format oftentimes you find yourself sitting in the audience going you know they did a lot of work to replicate the underlying layers that these other people have already developed they could have built on top of those layers gotten their website done just the way they wanted and probably saved a lot of work. But then you realize also as a software developer who yourself uses lots of packages from other people, every time you touch someone else's software, you sort of like you enter into this, um, a kind of a relationship. And it's, it's a very expensive relationship, especially if it doesn't work out well. So there's a high degree of motivation for people to not do that because they don't want to take the risk of that 
of that dependency. So I think if we are to kind of, if IT and I is to be a forum where we can move beyond that, we have to address the risks and costs of those dependencies. That's really well put. Um, yeah, I, I, can I can I follow up on that, Dave? Please, please. I, I first off, James, excellent points. They really are, and you could, and all I would say is that you could take exactly what you're saying about in software and layer it on top of linked open data web architectural interdependencies as well, right? The minute you start trying to call in APIs or resource URIs, right? The the four hundred fours, the four hundred threes, everything like that. So, excellent point. Yeah, that's um, understanding understanding the risk you're taking on by using a dependency is probably the biggest thing in my mind. Like, because like when you're using linked open data, you can write your code to expect any one of those URLs to be 404 or whatever. Right. Um, but to the uninitiated developer, you might not know. Um, and the same thing goes for you know developing a, a server based on open source dependency stacks. Like you, you don't necessarily know which one of those is maintained by somebody who knows what they're doing. <laughs> um, yeah, that's good. I, I like that. It's interesting to think about whether there are lessons in the software development community in terms of dependencies and and those kinds of contracts between organizations that could be picked up and leveraged in the linked open data space. As we see more and more communities trying to say, oh, look, make all your data, you know, fair digital objects, fair resources. Oh, I'm gonna query all these resources on the web and bring them together. Even things like stack catalogs that reach out and, and pull things together at a catalog level for these types of things. It'd be interesting to see if there are patterns being used in software to approach these things that could come over in web architectural space to approach these things too. I think I was recently in a conversation with somebody about FAIR, because FAIR is a principle, right? It's something mm -hmm. that you aspire to. It's not really specific things that you can, well, you can check a box about, oh yeah, this data is interoperable, but people have different way of thinking about what interoperable means for uh, for that. And so principle is great, but um, we need to go to next level. So not just stop at the principle, because principle can be interpreted different ways and then it's hard to really to a, in a consistent fashion. Yeah, there's your two two years of talks, Dave, right there. Fair assessment. Oh, geez. No, how do? Yeah, no interpretation. Interpretation of what yeah. is fair against a use case is, um, yeah. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, I also when so when I apply the fair principles to for profit data. Um, it's a really interesting thing. It's an, it's an interesting thought experiment because hmm. you can have, like FAIR doesn't say anything about whether you have to pay for it. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Or data monetization in general, right? Yeah. I mean, even, even, even for things, I mean, look at like the JEPCO data and things like that, 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 that gets used in maps and stuff like that. How are there approaches to data monetization for federally funded data? to help support it and sustain it. So does anybody have experience with the ESIP wiki and have any ideas of um, things that could be done in that space, things that we could move out of that space? Like, you know, take, take, take some things that have maybe been tried there and do them elsewhere or I don't know, Megan, you, I was going to ask you for a little bit of a background on the wiki versus the commons too. Yeah, so the I, the way I like to, the yeah, um, the wiki is a sandbox for collaboration. It's not a place to publish, you know, final outputs, in my opinion. It's a great place for compiling lists and linking to things as a collaboration area, but um if appropriate, we think outputs belong elsewhere in the ESIP commons. Um, has largely, you know, it still exists, um, but it's not really promoted as a place we put things. Um, we have an ESIP fixture repository that sort of used, uh, fills the repository functionality that the commons used to provide. 
And then I think the wiki um, primarily fills the rest of the, the void. I think, um, you know, one, one thing I want to latch onto that you said before um, was this idea, I think you said breadcrumbs or just leaving something behind from each conversation that you have. I think there was some, there's one collaboration, a cluster that does that very well. It's Kathy Todd Brown's uh, Soil Ontology Group. And I think that just like a digestible bit, <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be anything like, you know, you don't have to write like a full length post every time you have one of these sessions, but just something a little bit more substantial left behind in combination with the recording um, might be a really nice contribution and might be something we could take, you know, once a year and and publish as a, a broader output or something, something a little bit more like a look back at where you've been over the last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, I guess one thought I had was, you know, currently the the IT and I wiki is a list of recordings with titles and a, maybe a little abstract. Um, I could see turning that into a page per meeting and try to build a bit of a structured or a uh, you know kind of a, a formulaic in the sense that there's a set of fields we try to populate um, yeah that describe what the outcomes were what we learned that kind of stuff and to be totally transparent kathy does this in github um, but i know you know a lot of some folks in isa aren't as excited about github um, I also have this conversation all the time where I don't discourage use of the wiki, but I encourage use of the wiki that doesn't require constant maintenance. So a lot of clusters, that's just where they're going to be. They're just going to decide I'm going to put something here and leave it until I feel like coming back. And that's that's a viable way to behave. Um, I don't want to you know shun those people either. Um, can you point me to the where the soil ontology groups stuff is. Um, that's interesting. There was some discussion of actually using Wikipedia, <laughs> um, which may or may not be welcome in Wikipedia, but there's certainly some stuff we do here that could be documented in that kind of a venue. Um, um i would you know <laughs> i would suggest that you don't do that um opened app of course has a, a wikipedia page i've never edited it i barely i barely ever read it um actually i hardly ever think about it um but the thing is that in wikipedia anybody can come in and edit the material and of course in the ESIP wiki in some sense anybody could but you know it's a little different I, I guess I'm not quite sure I see what's so bad about the ESIP wiki. It's a little messy, but that's how things are. And that's what my question was, you know, like is the, is, you know, other than the, the, the cost and the maintenance challenges that we are feeling on the staff side right now, mm. is this really a push on our side to kind of talk about it more and, and, and give it a purpose or recommend use of it? You know, we haven't really, done too much of that. There's a hand raised. Yeah, I think I'm going to wait until people are done with the topic of wiki because this will be a change of topic. <laughs> um, can I ask Megan, is the cost, which is which was about $20,000 a year, is that is that a, a significant burden on the on ESIP? I mean, does it seem like an expensive Thing, it's more than it... we spend on our other collaboration tools that are used more. Oh, okay. Um, and I should, you know, Allison in her roles actually um, does more to maintain the wiki space. So please, Allison, speak up. Fine. Yeah, one of the big issues right now, which makes some of the wiki conversations slightly more urgent, is that the current version that we're using is going to depreciate in September. So we either need to fork over $20,000 this year and make it work, or we need to come up with a different solution. Huh. And from a, a marketing standpoint, I, as the, the person who thinks about how does the rest of the world see ESIP, 
um, if you Google ESIP and some of our wiki pages come up first and somebody is diving into one of these sandbox spaces before they even get any context about ESIP, that's not ideal. And since it doesn't interface very well with our current website, nobody has like a chance to get like a first hmm. impression of ESIP besides one of these outdated spaces. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, we actually have the same duality. We have an, uh, web, one website. It's not nearly as good as your website in terms of presentation. And we have a wiki and they're kind of glued together via funky bridge. Um, so, um, but the cost of upgrade, your B wiki is based on media wiki. So the cost, that seems really high, to be honest. Um, but, but- And that, that includes, I should clarify, that does include like, that is our- our monthly fee that we pay for general maintenance which is nine hundred dollars a month yeah and then there is the additional costs we had done like a brand estimate and yeah. i don't know if anybody saw some of the colors changed on yeah. the wiki but a bunch of it is hard coded uh -huh. so we would have to go into individual pages and update some of the color schemes so like those easter egg boxes literally would have to be changed page by page. And to do all of that would be 15 hours of work for our contractor. Mm, right. And so there's things like that. And this update would take somewhere around 25 hours of work right. and it wouldn't change the functionality of the wiki. Right. So the it's like update. Yes. Right. Indeed. And okay. I said it a little more gingerly in my talk, but one of the questions is, you know, are we being kind of held over a fire by a particular contractor? Is there another option out there um, that might be better? I, I don't, I don't, I know Allison's done a lot of research and so I don't know that that is the answer, but we welcome your input. Yeah, I'd have to think there's a lot of organizations that are looking at a decade or more of wiki content, trying to figure out exactly this. Yeah. Um, this question. That's certainly the, the history in USGS of our Confluence Wiki and <laughs> needing to shut it down was right. quite a thing, you know? And yeah, no, I think, and, and, and I would, I would be, well, we'll be supportive, obviously, we'll be supportive of whatever direction things need to go um, and can definitely help um, as that, as that transition needs to happen. So. So yeah, D Douglas, what are you gonna turn turn us to? Yeah, just like put it in the chat. So thinking about going back to the topic I mentioned about the data standards, like different domain have their own data standards, data conventions. What we're trying to do now is to try to do a crosswalk between the AI readiness checklist and with different domain standards and, and conventions. So we would like to see what are different domain standards and data uh, conventions out there. So they're the most common ones like the CF convention and other things that we're already aware of, but not want to make sure that um, the broad community can share different data convention standards. So we can also look into. So that's a way to see how many different data standards are out there and then how, what's the gaps and difference between them. So that's, I would like to find a talk. Um, that goes a little, that goes one step deeper than that. Um, and actually tries to expose the, or tries to discuss the, the underlying, um, who would be the right person? Probably somebody in the library science world um, to, to kind of talk about the underlying, what is a data set that kind of underlies all these conventions um, to give us a starting point for those kinds of cross, you know, convention crosswalk activities, because there's, and what are, you know, it's conventions, de facto data standard formats, you know, actual ISO standards. There's, there's all kinds of different ways that people have thought about um, defining a standard for some kind of data package. Um, and I, I know that there's some library science kind of theory that underlies a lot of that. <laughs> it's almost philosophy, but it's actually real um, in the way that the data sets are structured. I just searched data standards and then the first 
couple uh, items is are from data.gov, from USGS, and from from EPA about different data standards. But in terms of curation of life science data, right? There's that's not going to be, but you know, those are just the links that show up on Google. There's all kinds of other stuff that I think this community could learn from. That's a little more basic, I guess. Um, Dave, I wonder with the, um, it's, we're getting near the top of the hour. If yeah. we, we, there are a lot of folks we haven't heard from and you do not need to show your face or say anything, but if in the chat, there's something you're really excited about, could be anything, literally anything, in line with what we talked about or not. And I would be interested in what that, you know, just what you're interested in and like at what level. Like I would love to know because we've been talking about like going really deep or you know, introduction, medium, deep. To, I don't. We should have put this in a Slido poll. Actually, that would have been fabulous. Um, but I'm just curious what we can crowdsource from you guys. What would keep me coming back next time, or yeah. what's the theme that would excite you over the year? Yeah, if anybody wants to pick up, we still have time. What do you want to learn about? <laughs> and if there's not, um, hopefully this has been a useful conversation because this this is more or less where I think we will take things. I'm, if anybody wants to follow with me with some specific ideas of people or topics or anything, I'm all ears. I really do want this to be crowdsourced. Um, you know, I, I've got some ideas based on all the stuff we've talked about thus far. Um, and we'll, um, we'll keep the rant and rave um, format, keep these to keep these to 20 ish minutes um, with a discussion. And I think probably I kind of want to do the YouTube series as more like 20 minute talks and not necessarily have them be, you know, webinars um, and have it be a little tighter, not TED talk style totally, but like a little tighter piece of content that's thought out a little more. Um, and we'll get some, I, I'm gonna invite some, some um, we'll see what we can get. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna reach out to some people that may say no, and I'm fine with that. But I want to see if we can get some people that would would be really interesting to hear from. So, um, and then we'll uh, we'll cook up some kind of some kind of way to have everybody contribute to something that that um, is carries on beyond the beyond the webinar. Um, yeah, I'm. <laughs> um, I want to I want to invite some some of the progenitors of some of the patterns that we use and some some of the top people in the open source world to come and give give talks for sure. So. All right, well, if there's nothing else, hopefully that was halfway interesting. Thanks for the discussion. Um, and give everybody a couple more, couple minutes. Thanks, everybody. Dave, if you have a second. Thanks. Talk to you later.